The new Harry Potter TV show is coming, probably in 2026, and I'm currently working my way through a series of videos where I talk about how I would turn each of the books into a season of TV that is good and well-paced and emotionally interesting. Spoiler alert, it's hard, particularly with the first three. With that said, there are things that I really think they need to make sure they include in the TV show. And by things, I don't just mean plot points. I'm not saying things like Neville is the chosen one or spew or though I think it would be good to include those things. What I mean is details, like small characteristics or styles or moments or feelings that, in my opinion, will really make or break this show for the fans. It's gonna be things that will make the Wizarding World feel real and vibrant, and that will make our characters feel deeper and easier to connect with as an audience. Because the thing is, we have the plot already in the books. I could have pointed either side, I have too many Harry Potter books. But they give us the plot already, and so do the films, right? For the most part, anyway. Where the show really needs to excel is it needs to give us that feeling, you know? Because lots of people are gonna be comparing the new TV show to what we already have. And so these are the details I think it needs to include that will make it so much better. We cannot have wizards dressed as muggles. From the very first chapter, it is clear that wizards dress funny. Uncle Vernon notices them on the street and comments on what they're wearing. And then beyond that, in the Goblet of Fire, it is a huge and hilarious aspect of the Quidditch World Cup, where wizards have no idea how to blend in with muggles. I'm pretty sure one wizard shows up in a nightdress. Now in the films, we had wizards dressed as humans. Well, they're humans, but like muggle humans. Like maybe a little bit old fashioned, but largely they would just wear like suits and waistcoats and things. And the kids in basically every film besides the first two spend so much time in regular muggle clothing, like jeans and t-shirts and jumpers. This show really needs to create an aesthetic for wizarding wardrobes that really set their society apart. Like, if the first season of the TV show gives us that opening scene where Uncle Vernon sees all of these wizards celebrating Voldemort's defeat out on the street, we need them to be in bright green robes and obnoxious gowns and wearing strange things so we can tell they are different and eccentric. For me, this is a key way the show can, from the very first moment, really stand out from the films and give itself a notable look and style. Harry James Potter is sassy and sarcastic. He is funny, he is ironic, he's got a really dry sense of humour. And in the films, we don't really get a whole lot of that. Like, a little bit in The Half-Blood Prince, particularly when he takes Felix Felicis. But mostly, Harry is kind of just bland in the films, and sometimes angry. And that's a real shame, because Daniel Radcliffe was so good at being sassy and sarcastic, and it kind of feels like it was a waste. So in the show, I think we really need Harry to be dropping lines like, Ah yes, the news. It changes every day, you see. And there's no need to call me Sir Professor to Snape. And uh, also, oh, I really wonder what it would be like having a difficult life to Ron and Hermione after he's been almost killed by Voldemort a number of times. I just, I feel like we need this version of Harry because it stops him from being such a one-dimensional protagonist who is just good and does good things and always chooses to do the right thing. Like, give us a real teenage human Harry, you know? Speaking of teenagers, we've done something about Harry. Now for Ron and Hermione. In the films, I feel like their relationship kind of comes out of nowhere. But in the books, there are so many instances where Harry is the last one to join the trio because he's been off dealing with his own thing. Abusive muggles or mass murdering psychopath wizards. But because he's been off dealing with that, it means that Ron and Hermione spend a good amount of time together, just the two of them. In the summers, Harry is often the last one to join them at the burrow or at Grimmel Place. At Hogwarts, Harry has Quidditch practice or detention or secret sessions with Snape or Dumbledore. And while Harry's off doing that and we see that because it's from Harry's perspective, Ron and Hermione are gonna be hanging out, just the two of them. Seeing those moments, or at least alluding to them, should give us a chance to see that Ron and Hermione have been spending lots of one-on-one -on -one time together, and if the show isn't strictly from Harry's perspective, then we should see some of those moments from Ron and Hermione. Because in the films, apart from the strange jealousy when Crumb shows an interest in Hermione, we never really see anything hinting at a thing between these two, at least until the Half-Blood Prince. And then it sort of goes from naught to 100 very quickly. Which, you know, I guess teenage hormones can be like that. But since Ron and Hermione go on to get married and have children, it would be nice to see glimpses of those foundations slowly being built, especially since in The Philosopher's Stone, Ron actually kind of dislikes Hermione for a lot of it. So I really want the show to give us a look at that turning around gradually and Ron and Hermione having a relationship that exists without Harry. So the Ron and Hermione thing kind of plays into my next point, which is 
show, don't tell. And this is important in storytelling in general, and I don't think the books do a great job of it. So this is a way that the TV show can improve upon the books, whereas I've kind of focused in this video on how the TV show can improve upon the movies. Like, in these Harry Potter books, we get told a lot of the story, right, rather than shown it. And I get it, it's because a lot of it's from Harry's perspective and that's how he gets information. But I actually think, especially from a character perspective, it does a disservice. And there's one particular example I can think of, which I'll get to in a minute. But this is a TV show, right? I would like us to be shown things. Having lore just dumped on us and explained to us is a really easy way to make your audience feel like you think they're stupid. So for example, before we get the reveal that Crookshanks was helping Sirius, I would like us to make sure we get subtle hints through the entire season, glimpses of moments where Crookshanks might be doing exactly that, acting strangely, which by the end of it we see is Crookshanks helping Sirius. Neville is using his father's wand for the first like five years that he's at Hogwarts, and when he finally gets his own wand, he's much better at magic. And I want the show to give us hints that he doesn't have that unique connection with a wand that has chosen him, like people like Harry do. Rather than just tell us when he gets a new wand that he's better at magic, show us. Show us that he doesn't have that connection until he gets his own wand. The main example from the books where we are told rather than shown is Voldemort being evil. Hagrid just tells Harry how awful Voldemort was. Ollivander tells Harry about the terrible things Voldemort did. We, as an audience, are told Voldemort is a big, scary, evil guy. But it's far more impactful if we see it. How they do that, I'm not entirely sure, maybe through flashbacks. I just think they need to make it more obvious that an entire generation of wizards were lost in that first war with Voldemort. Make the shudders to his name more pronounced. Make it more obvious what wizarding civilization lost because of him before his first downfall. There is a reason why the fandom often considers Umbridge to be the most evil person in the Harry Potter series, despite the fact that Voldemort is a mass murdering psychopath. We are shown Umbridge's cruelty rather than just told about it. We see first years with cuts on their hands. We see the oppression she instills in Hogwarts rippling through the castle. When we are shown something, it hits harder than just being told about it. And so I think the show really needs to show rather than tell. Characters like Snape, and the Marauders were all aged up in the films. And I'm not too upset about it because we've got Alan Rickman and Gary Oldman and iconic actors giving iconic performances as these characters that we've all grown to love. But a big part of the tragedy of this story is that Harry's parents were just 21 years old when they were murdered. Sirius, Wormtail, Lupin, Snape, they were barely adults when they were caught up in this first Wizarding War. Wormtail's story is so different when you know that he was in his teens and his early 20s. Because sure, he's a coward who turned on his friends and that's awful, but it's a totally different story when he's a grown man making those choices versus if he's portrayed as a scared, naive young man who's out of his depth. It just, it adds a whole other layer, right? When we realize that Sirius went from school to fighting in a war immediately and then spent 12 years in Azkaban before he's eventually killed, we realize he never actually lived as an adult. It makes his death so much more heartbreaking. And also some of the nuances of his character where he's kind of juvenile and treats Harry like his best friend James, it all makes a bit more sense when he's not like a man in his 40s and 50s. Lupin, who was scared of being ostracized the entire time he was growing up as a werewolf, and then he finally finds accepting friends, but then they're all gone before he can have any kind of an adult life with them and then he feels ostracized and alone again. So like their stories are more emotionally poignant, but then also characters like McGonagall are richer for these other characters being the correct age. When McGonagall talks about the story of James and Sirius and Wormtail in the Three Broomsticks during Prisoner of Azkaban, we get glimpses of a maternal side of her, that these mischievous students she'd overseen for seven years had their lives turned upside down or taken away from them so early in their life. That maternal side of her is so much more hard hitting if there hasn't been like a 15 year period where they graduated school before they were killed or thrown into these situations. And I think there are parallels between McGonagall feeling like that towards James and Sirius and that group, and the glimpses we get of her feeling protective towards Harry, for example with Umbridge, or in the last book where she sees him being pulled into a war like his father was, and she's like, oh, it's good to see you, Potter. Ah, oh, what a moment. There's such a big part of Harry Potter that is history repeating itself, and without these characters being aged up, History is so quickly repeating itself that those narrative strokes hit harder. We see it with Snape as well, right? He drops the line to Dumbledore about Harry being raised just to be killed at the right time. And it feels far more loaded when you think about the fact that Snape was pulled into a war at Harry's age too. And he saw Lily, the woman he loves, being killed not much older than Harry. All of these emotional moments feel more poignant if the characters 
at the correct age. Plus, there are the parallels, right, between Hermione and Lupin, and Harry and James, and Lily and Ginny, and Snape and Draco, and Ron and Sirius, and maybe even Neville and Peter. And that's evident in the history repeating itself side of things too. These characters, their journeys, their decisions, where they end up, they are far more significant if we know that the older generation weren't actually that much older. But they were going through very similar things at very similar points in their life to the Golden Trio and their generation. That said, it will be strange seeing a Snape or a Sirius in their mid-30s as opposed to in their like 40s and 50s, but I think it's important we do. And if you want to know my other thoughts on the TV show, check out this video where I talk about why The Prisoner of Azkaban doesn't really lend itself to a very good TV show, structurally at all.